everybody, it's a fiasco. I'm Matthias, I'm a Japanese, I'm a front-end web developer from Belgium. And uh, about a little year ago, I made this website called Jasper. I'm not sure if anyone has heard of it or used it before. Please raise your hands. Okay, that's not bad. It's good to hear. Well, uh, today I'd like to talk about that and how we can use Jasper to create valid performance test cases and focuses on valid parts. So just to reiterate, uh, Jasper, back when it was launched, it was just my spaghetti code written in PHP uh, to communicate to my SQL server. I have to be honest, I was expecting to get a, a little, a couple of boos from the audience here because it's not written in Node, but okay, here we come. Uh, but uh, the day that Jasper was launched, I also uh, started the benchmark JS project. Because of course, uh, to run benchmarks, you need in JavaScript a benchmarking library. And originally, I just took out the benchmarking algorithm of the JS Litmus by Robert Kiefer. And I threw out everything else that I didn't need, and then I added my own stuff to it. And that's what I named Benchmark JS. So in the beginning, it was really Jasper specific, and it was not much of a general purpose um, benchmarking library. But I was open sourced it, hoping that the community would see it and would help me improve it uh, over time. And luckily, uh, someone stepped up uh, a couple of months later, which is John David Delton. Uh, and he made it much more awesome. Uh, he did a lot of bug fixes, he added more features, and he made it uh, a generic library that works across different environments. And the, I mean, the best thing about it, the best thing that he did was add crazy browser support. I mean, he had support for browsers that are so obscure that even this guy has never heard of them. <laughs> I'm not sure what this is doing here. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so we have the PHP code, uh, we have benchmark TS, and then the final ingredient for JSPerf is uh, browser scope, which is the, the project that we're using to store the results based on your browser. So after you run a test, we, we gather those results and uh, we store them so we can show you a nice little table or a chart uh, which contains all the information uh, of the tests that have been run by other users. And the browser scope guys actually had to uh, tweak their API for us so that we uh, would be able to automatically create new tests with them for every new test case that's created on JSPerf. So thank you, browser scope. Now here's some uh, quick statistics. They're not all that interesting, but uh, the main thing to remember here is that um, ever since JSPerf was launched, there are about, well, almost 57 new test cases added every day. And I mean, I think that's a lot of test cases, and that's all very good news, but there is a problem with that. And the problem is that about 68% of all JSPerf test cases is broken, according to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, and well, it's true, mistakes are very easy to make, and it, it kind of sucks uh, because JSPerf allows you to easily create test cases, but you know, even the tiniest little mistake that you make or the tiniest uh, typo in your code uh, will just render the test invalid and the results will be meaningless. And was it not William Shakespeare who has written, it would be unwise to take all JSPR results for granted? <laughs> well, he was right. Uh, it would be very nice if we would be able to just browse JSPR and, uh, you know, look at the results and make a decision based on that. But unfortunately, it's not that simple because there are too many mistakes that are made. And I've written about benchmarking pitfalls before. Uh, together with John David Dalton again. Uh, if you're interested, you can just read the article, Bulletproof JavaScript Benchmarks, the link is at the bottom. But um, the main topics there are that there are a lot of inaccurate millisecond timers in different operating systems and browsers. And of course, if you're benchmarking code in JavaScript, you will need to work around that to still get an accurate result. I probably don't need to tell you that browsers have bugs. So if those bugs affect the way you benchmark code, you will need to work around those bugs as well. And maybe one of the biggest problems with benchmarking is that you will need to have statistically significant results. Uh, if you don't do statistical analysis on your results, uh, they're not completely meaningless, but you know, they're not as it should be. And this really sounds self-evident, uh, but if you want to run a test and you later rerun the same test on the same browser and the same device with the same settings, the same everything, uh, you're gonna want to get the same results, right? Uh, and it makes sense, but uh, even the bigger browser benchmarks like SunSpider and Kraken, uh, they still don't get this quite right. So if you run the same tests uh, twice in the same browser, sometimes it will tell you that your browser is faster or slower than itself. So you know, the results, they're not really uh, as meaningful as they should be. 
Uh, another thing to consider is that there are browser plugins and add-ons that may influence the results. Um, for example, Firebug in Firefox is known to disable the JIT in Firefox, so uh, all JavaScript that you will run will run much slower. Um, and on Jasper, we try to warn you uh, if Firebug is enabled, we try to detect it and show a warning, but it's still up to you to disable Firebug and rerun the test. Because, for example, it wouldn't be fair if you were to compare the uh, test in Chrome and you would compare the number of operations per second that you would get from JSPerf with the num number of operations per second that you would get in Firefox with Firebug enabled. That wouldn't be a fair comparison at all. Of course, Firefox is going to be slower that way. Uh, another thing to consider is that you should always test in all the browsers that you're planning to support. There's no point in creating a test case and just running a test in, say, Safari, if you're going to support all browsers all the way back to IE6. Every browser is different, every JavaScript engine is different, so it's very important to test in every engine that you're planning to support. And, well, maybe the biggest problem of all is that a lot of tests are incorrect or uh, make assumptions that aren't quite right. Now, when we look at these six bullet points, we can divide them into two groups. And the first one are three things that Benchmark.js and thus JSPerf takes care of for you. So good news is you don't have to worry about these three things. And again, the bad news is that you will have to worry about these three things. Uh, these are things that JSPerf cannot enforce on you, so you will have to take care of it yourself. It, in the end, it's you who has to write the test and run them correctly, so uh, please do that correctly. Now, uh, let's see what's the most common problem with tests when they're unfair comparisons. Uh, incorrect tests suck, so let's see what we can do about them. Here are a couple of uh, quick hit hints and quick tips that you can use to make better test cases in JSPerf. Uh, so, the function declarations that you will use in your test, they should go either in the preparation code or in the setup code. So on JSPerf, that looks kind of like this. You have this big text area where you can enter all the JavaScript that will be executed first time um, in the global scope. So if you have any functions that you want to declare, just do it there. Don't do it in the test body itself. Only the bare minimum should go inside of each test body. So ideally, you would get something like this. You see, it's really concise. Um, Honestly, I've seen people include the entire jQuery source in the test body itself, and that's not how Jasper works. Um, yeah, well, a good example of a test case is this one. Um, this is the preparation code that we saw earlier, and this is how, what it will look like when the test case is finished. So you get a syntax highlighted view of the code. Uh, you get a nice little table with all the different tests in them, and then there's a button that allows you to run the tests, and the results will look something like this, depending on the browser, of course. Uh, and Jasper will show you which one is fastest and which one is slowest. Here's another common problem. Uh, I made this test case uh, regarding Fibonacci numbers. So I found a couple of functions that uh, allow th that we, you pass an argument, which is an index, and then it returns you the Fibonacci number with that index from the sequence. And you know, I ran some tests and it turned out that the first solution that I found was much, much, much faster. As you can see, the second option is about 98% slower. Uh, that's kind of a big difference. So, yeah, the first reaction would be, yeah, okay, let's use the first one. It's much faster. But long story short, uh, you got to make sure the methods you're comparing actually do exactly the same thing. If they don't, it's not really a fair comparison. And depending on your use case, that may or may not be a problem. So. If there is a difference in the different functions that you're testing, please uh, be polite and mention it in the description of your test case, because other people will look at it, and uh, it's best not to confuse them. So in this case, I uh, investigated a little further, and I noticed that the first function only handles indexes up to 1,474, while the second function allows indexes up to 1,476. Now, that may not be much of a difference, but depending on your use case, it may be. So it's important to uh, be aware of it. And also, I later found out that the first function, you know, the super fast one, um, starts to return inaccurate results starting at the index uh, 76. So, again, depending on your use case, that may not be a problem if you're just getting an uh, approximation, but maybe it is. And then you still have to use the second function even though it's slower. So that's something to consider. Another thing is uh, you have to make sure that you're really testing what you intended to test. 
And a good example of that, well, a bad example of that is this test case. The title is uh, jQuery ID versus native get element by ID. So you would expect a test case where uh, you would get an element based on its ID using jQuery versus using uh, document.get element by ID. But when I looked at the test, it looked something like this. As you can see, uh, what this is really testing is how long it takes to bind an event handler, either using the dumb zero window.onload or by using jQuery and calling the load method. Which, by the way, I don't think load works the way the other thinks it does because load is used for IX stuff in uh, jQuery. Um, so really, uh, whatever is inside of the event handler here, it doesn't really matter because it won't ever get called uh, during the tests. So even if, you know, even if the second test would have a super slow uh, event handler, it won't matter in this case. And you can tell because both results are the same. The last result, of course, is a little slower because you're making a call to jQuery there, but this test is kind of rubbish. Another thing to consider is that when you're reusing variables across tests, uh, you need to make sure that you reset them whenever it's necessary. For example, this test case here, uh, they're trying to compare uh, if it's faster to do A plus equals B or if it's faster to do A equals A plus B, which both do the same thing. And honestly, I would expect both to be equally fast. And it's a very micro optimization anyway. Uh, it, the problem with this setup is that in the preparation code, uh, A is set to 2 and then the tests uh, start running. So by the time test 1 starts, A equals 2 and it's incremented all the time. But by the time test one has finished and test two starts running, A will be a much higher number. It will have a much higher value. So that may or may not make a difference in the results. And in fact, in Opera, uh, this is a screenshot from Opera, and there it does really make a, a big difference. As you can tell, uh, the second method seems to be 13% slower, but it's not actually slower. It's just because the number A has a much higher starting value for the second test. So it's not a fair comparison. The fun thing is that if we rerun the same test afterwards, so after we get uh, super high values for A, we run the test again, uh, we get a completely different result. Because now we see that both tests uh, turn out to be equally fast. So whenever that happens on Jasper, there's something wrong with your test case. If you run the same test twice and you get different results, something is wrong. That's a red flag. Another good idea is to never introduce randomness in your tests. I saw this test case here. Uh, and as you can see, inside the test body, um, the author used map.random to generate random numbers, and then round them down, and then do some other stuff with them. The problem with this is that there's always a chance that you get uh, numbers that are slightly faster to round down in one of the tests. So you will never know if actually the, the function that you're testing is faster or if it's something else that's influencing the results. So if you want to test with different numbers, that's great, but just add multiple tests to the same test case and don't use random numbers. Another pro tip is uh, never test asynchronous stuff synchronously. It sounds logical, but a lot of people make the mistake. For example, uh, this test case. As you can see, we're testing two different functions in a set timeout, in the same set timeout, and they turn out to be both as fast, even though the first, so the test one function, uh, is supposed to be fast, while the test two function is supposed to be super slow. And of course, they're equally fast for Jasper because uh, you're testing something asynchronously that's, uh, you're testing something synchronously that's supposed to be asynchronous. Uh, the set timeout, it will, yeah, it basically it's a no operation test initially. The, the functions will be called eventually, but they will be called outside of the test loop, so it won't be timed. So in this case, you get, it seems like they're both as fast, but it's not really the case. If you want to do a synchronous test, uh, here's a good example of doing that right. So Jasper has this checkbox for every test that you add. And this is an asynchronous test. Uh, well, if it is, just hit the checkbox. And then all you need to do is uh, you, you get a deferred object for free, and you just need to call resolve on that object, and then the test will finish. So for example, in the HTML5 spec, uh, the minimum set timeout value allowed is 4. 
and that wasn't spec before, so I decided to figure out which browsers already support this feature. Um, so the idea is that if you would use zero as a timeout, uh, it would still use four instead. So I created this test case. Uh, see, the only thing that's different is the timeout value that's always increasing. By the way, that last value uh, is really weird, but some browsers have an issue where uh, if you use this value or a higher value, it will still use zero or four instead. It's uh, really freaky. So I added that to the test. This is a good example of an asynchronous test. It also really helps if you learn the difference between preparation code and the setup and the teardown sections. So JSPerf looks something like this, right? And these are the most basic fields where you can enter your author details and the, the title of the test case. But here's the interesting part. So you get a preparation code uh, for HTML. I like to call this the preparation H field. And uh, there's also a field for JavaScript. And all you need to know is that this code will be inserted into an HTML document. Uh, so the JavaScript that you enter there will be evaluated in the global scope. So if you were to create a new variable in the preparation code for JavaScript, it would become a global variable. The difference with the setup and the teardown test is that they run in the same scope as the actual tests. So um, whatever code you enter here, it still won't be timed, same as, the, uh, same as the preparation code. It won't be timed, but they do run in the same scope, which allows you to do all kinds of crazy and cool stuff. For example, uh, there's this test case that Malte made a couple of weeks ago. And well, the setup is like this. He, as you can see, he creates some global variables here. And uh, for example, the i variable, He's using that in the test, in, he's using that in every test. So that's not a problem because the same scope lookup is done in every test. But then, for example, if you look at the bool variable, he's only using that one in the first two tests. So those first two tests, they have the performance penalty, penalty of a scope lookup while the other ones don't. So it would be slightly better and slightly more fair if you would, were to change the test and use the setup code instead. So all that we changed is we moved the variable declarations to the setup code, and this way uh, the variables are created in the same scope as the tests themselves. So no scope lookups and no performance penalty for the first two tests. And I think this is a slightly more fair comparison. Again, this may not make much of a difference in every browser, but in some browsers it does, and in some situations it does. So it's better to do it this way. Another example of using these uh, advanced features is the DOM cleanup. For example, when you're uh, testing how long it takes to insert a new element into the DOM, you, you could do it like this without using setup. You could just use a preparation code. You could create a new container element, store a reference to that element and a variable called EL. And then we just use that variable in every test. The problem with this setup is that test code is repeated potentially millions of times. So uh, this would add a lot of elements to the DOM. All right. Uh, so the problem with this setup is that the test code is repeated potentially millions of times. So this would add a lot of elements to the DOM. And things might get slow. Uh, the thing is, you're only trying to test how long it takes to insert the new elements. And, not, uh, and you know, it may be faster if the DOM is already huge. It may be slower if the DOM is already huge uh, if you're inserting a new element then. So ideally, we would reset the container element and we would clear it of all its children. And we can use the setup code for that. So the setup code will be run before each uh, test batch. So uh, right here, we just clear the inner HTML, which will effectively remove all child elements. However, uh, we can still optimize this test case a little bit because we are only interested in how long it takes to insert the element into the DOM. And right here, we're still creating the diff and the p element in memory. So that also gets timed. And that's also going to influence the results. So if you want, we could simplify this into something like this, where we basically uh, we create the elements in the setup code as well. And then the test bodies themselves are as small as possible and you only really time how long it takes to append the new elements. And as a bonus, uh, by doing it this way, it will always reuse the same elements rather than creating new ones every time. So there's only ever going to be one child element in the container element this way. So it's much better. 
another pro tip is that uh, benchmark JS is used on JSPerf, and there are a lot of uh, advanced settings that you can use that JSPerf doesn't even have a user interface for. So if you can just go to the documentation, if you read through the API, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can discover and tricks that you can use on JSPerf. For example, I created this test case uh, to test how long it takes to remove a child element. And so let's see, we want to test how slow it is to remove an element from the DOM. Uh, I've only added one test, and all that's happening there is an element gets removed. That's it. Uh, the problem is uh, we need enough elements so we, we can remove them, because we don't know how many times the test will be repeated, uh, because J benchmark JS will automatically calculate that for us. Now, the thing is we can actually get uh, the, the test count by using this in the setup function. The this will refer to the current benchmark instance, and every benchmark instance gets a count property which uh, refers to the number of times the test will be iterated. So this way we just, uh, yeah, if you just look at the setup code here, we're just adding as many child elements that we need, so exactly the right amount. So that's, I thought it was pretty neat. Of course, there's some other stuff that uh, may mess with your results that we didn't cover here, like uh, unexpected browser features. For example, Opera suddenly decided to start caching the query selector all results. Uh, and of course, if you're testing, uh, if you're creating a benchmark for query selector or query selector all, uh, Opera has a, a huge advantage. So ideally, you would have to work around it by uh, using a different selector every time. Another dangerous thing is that code removal. Of course, that's uh, very hard to predict. And you know, if, if there's, if you're getting weird results, uh, you know, some dead code may be in there. Of course, there is much more. Uh, but the idea is that if we all help each other, if we see a test case that's incorrect in some way, just leave a comment uh, or fork it and improve it, just so others can learn from it as well. That's it from me. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Are you planning any new features to guess? Hmm. Uh, well, question. yeah, well, the question was, uh, am I planning on adding new features to JSPerf? Uh, the answer is that there's a whole lot of things on my to-do list. Uh, and one of which is adding a search functionality to JSPerf, because right now, uh, well, until a couple of weeks ago, you go to the browse page and you will get, get back all test cases. Uh, but I checked it last week and it was about an HTML document of about two and a half megabytes. So it, it has gotten quite large. Uh, there's a lot of test cases on there, so I really need to do something about it. And the quick fix was to just limit the browse page to 250 latest tests. So that's what happened now. But I'm planning to add a uh, search functionality to it soon. Um, I think there are another, uh, a couple of other things lined up there. Uh, but there's a, a GitHub repo. If you check my user account, matches Bannons on uh, GitHub. Uh, there's a repo for jsperf.com. There's no code inside of it yet. I plan on open sourcing the PHP one day. But uh, I'm a bit too ashamed of it right now, so I need to clean it up a little bit. Uh, the repository has an issue tracker and all my to-do items are being tracked there. So if you have any suggestions, you're free to just file a new ticket and I'll see what I can do. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, Jake. <laughs> if, uh, if people have questions about JSPerf, like why choose your app, or where do you want to go? Okay. Oh, right. Right. If you have questions, you can always ping uh, either me or Jay Dalton. Or there's also this Twitter account of JSPerf itself, and it's JSPRF, because some other guy named Joey Persplagi uh, has the other account. Uh, so if you have any questions, just, other, uh, just mention JSPRF in your tweet, and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Yeah.